right, so um, welcome to the fourth annual Den Music Fest. Um, Den Music Fest is a project that Last Name Good and I started four years ago. Um, and not only this year did we manage to put on a whole virtual show in the midst of a pandemic, but we've actually expanded to add a second day of events, which is today, um, where we have a full day of artist development workshops. So Justin, do you want to say a few words before we jump off? Sure. Uh, first off, thank you for everyone that's here um, for the artist development sessions. Uh, thank you, Ace, for taking the time out to be with us this, this afternoon. I know you're a busy person and you have a schedule to keep. So uh, we'll try to keep this as brief as possible and, and most importantly, as informative as we possibly can. Uh, just like Nora said, uh, we had this a short window uh, to, to do the festival this year and uh, due to COVID and, and some other things that were happening, uh, we had to, to shift our model and respectively so uh, it worked out we were able to put on a, on a nice festival yesterday and today we we're actually able to add an additional day which was in our plans uh, to do so for 2020 anyway so uh, we adjusted just like all of you are adjusted and hopefully what you hear today is some valuable information for you and if it's not for you it's definitely some information that you can pass on to someone else so uh, looking forward to giving all the insight we can today um, so for folks who are here, we really do want this to be conversational. I have a couple questions. Ace and I will get into a conversation, but we really want this to be a value for you. So if you have questions, please feel free to, you know, raise your hand, um, drop it in the chat. We invite you to turn your camera on. No one cares um, if the house is messy or the kids are running around or whatever. One of the, the things about Den Music Fest is really just show up as you are, come as you are. You're in my kitchen, um, you know, we're all in the same kind of situation. And so we invite you to um, uh, turn your cameras on so that we can see each other and really start to build. We are recording this. Um, and the only other thing that we ask is um, that folks just be respectful. And if you're not respectful, we will remove you because um, you know how we treat each other really matters. So to jump into it, um, our, our guest today is Ace Harris. Ace is a Grammy-winning producer, he's head of a r at Reach Records, um, has been creating music for himself and for others for a really, really long time. Um, Ace, welcome. Um, do you want to introduce yourself real quick to folks? What up, Nora? What up, Jay? Um, man, this is this is dope what y'all do. I mean, like, you know, shout out y'all being a conduit for independent artists. I remember being, coming up in Atlanta, it was always platforms like this that always even though y'all do it a little better than some of them. Um, but it was always dope to kind of see people give a voice and also be like an educational um, space for artists trying to figure out how to navigate. So shout out to y'all for what y'all do. Um, in a nutshell, um, I'm a music producer. Uh, that's kind of like my main um, thing that I've done and, and am known for, but also a and all at a record label called Reach Records, which has like nine, nine artists on there. and. Um, and uh, yeah, so professionally is what I do. Personally, I'm married to 10 years, two kids. And uh, yeah, just about making dope music, uh, managing projects. And then I've always kind of been a hybrid person, like half creative, half administrative. So I'm like having that ability to talk to the label about sales and budgets, have those hard conversations, and also tell an artist how to make the song better. And while the label in their head thinks it's trash, but I'm like thinking this has potential. I'm trying to push the artist to see the best in the song and give them, give them to trust me so that we can get to that sweet spot of creative excellence. So that's kind of in a nutshell, my my thing is being creative and administrative. And uh, yeah, um, again, excited to be here. Um, it's, so, I mean, what you just touched on, I think is a really important foundational question. Um, so many people claim to be a &Rs, or they're confused about what an a &R does. Um, can you break it down for folks what exactly is and is not an a &R. Right. I mean, to be honest, this is kind of a funny joke because I've seen this on Twitter a few times with some of my friends who work in the music business and they're like, yo, everybody on Clubhouse is an a &R. <laughs> Cause like everybody, <laughs> it's just yeah. funny because it's like, I, I, I haven't jumped in the conversation to like retweet it cause I don't want to be that guy. But I do think it's funny that, you know people aspire for the title but sometimes don't understand what it takes. So I guess I'll break yeah. it down. Stands for artist and repertoire. Um, I stutter, so I always mess that word up, but you, you get my point. Um, 
which is basically artists and songs, right? So artists and songs. So the, the main thing is basically um, finding talent, developing talent, and then signing that talent to the label, but then also developing songs for that talent so they can be them best, to be their best self. So artists and songs, that's kind of like, you know, the two things I deal with a lot. Some people like to get into the weeds of like making these projects and all these things. But at the end of the day, the music business is founded on songs by artists. So good songs by great artists. That's the that's like the lifeblood of the music business. So it's like if that isn't done well, then there's no music business, and then I, I really have no you know real purpose. So that's kind of essentially what you know what I do. Um you talk a lot about the balance between the music and the art and then the business. And I think for a lot of artists, it's so easy to be like, well, I just wanna make music. And they focus on the craft. What would you advise or what do you think is really important for artists to consider on the business tip, especially for independent artists who might not have access to like a team or infrastructure? Well, yeah, I mean, it's important because I, I would say even if an artist isn't signed to a label, which is not a mark of whether an artist is or could be successful, that we all know that, right? But for the independent artists, the artists that know how to think with like a little bit of an A and R mind, I think they flourish and thrive better. As in, and they're making as they're making their craft, thinking from a the way to be business about it, which without killing the artistic vibe, is to think about what am I making and how do I gain the most maximum exposure for my songs. That's, that's in the simplest form, how does my song reach the most people? So, I mean, some artists struggle with that because it's like um, they want to make music that comes from their heart and it flows from them and that's great and that's perfectly fine. But are you making music for yourself or for yourself and for a larger audience? So songs that impact a bigger space have certain ingredients into it. Not saying you have to sell out commercially, but as you're creating, the artist that can just consider like, yo, if I add, if I put this person on the hook, if I get this feature, if I use this type of production, if I kind of bring it into my world and just think from a broader standpoint, it makes better songs, which I think is a way to think business about your art. You know what I'm saying? What's, what's the balance then between making music that's audience focused, right? And audiences, like they hear a trend, so they just want to, you know, they want to listen to that trend and versus making music that's maybe innovative or different or cutting edge. How does an artist balance that? Um, I think it's, balance is important. It's never either or, it's always both and. So artists I think are specific to their DNA. If an artist has a mellow or lo-fi sound that is not necessarily a popular, broad appealing sound, I'm not saying for that artist to go and make a song like that. I'm just saying within your niche, within your creative distinction, how do you make the most broadest lo-fi song? That's what I think, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So the balance is do what you do and figure out how to make it for mo the most, as many people as, as possible who like what you do. Yeah. So it's kind of like, no, go ahead. No, no, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so it's like, yeah. So if you are a rapidly rap dude, I'm not saying go get, you know, Roddy Rich hook. That's not what you do. You know what I'm saying do you, but think about how to make the best, most broad appealing, rapidly rap, conscious rap driven song. You know what I'm saying? So they can reach the most amount of people. That's all. Yeah. Well, and I think underlying that is when you mentioned niche is really understanding your genre, but also understanding your audience and what do they want and what do they need and what do they care about. And sometimes that's music, but sometimes that's things outside of music. So then how can you incorporate that into your story? So really understanding, you know, you can't, I like, for example, I ask artists all the time, who are you making music for? And they say everybody, but you no. can't make music for everybody. And so maybe Ace, you can break that down a little folks, how important it is to understand your niche because you can't please yeah. everybody. I mean, yeah, you just, taking care of your base is important with any artist and audience like it's feed your feed your base and in, in a perfect world your base will amplify your music because they'll go and tell more people who are not in your base and then your music can spread that's like the you know music business one-on-one -on -one growth metric 
you, you have a base, you feed your audience, your audience loves you so much, they tell other people your audience grows. But I, 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 it's important, the, the struggle, honestly, Noah, comes from like, when you're trying to feed your base and expand your base, that's where the tension comes because sometimes your core niche base doesn't want you to expand the way you want to because mm -hmm. they're afraid that it could dilute the like integrity in the music. You know what I'm saying? So they want you, so you have to like do it in a delicate way. There have been artists who have done that and they've lost some of their like niche uh, following because they're like, yo, man, you, you, you sold out on me or whatever. But there's, there's a delicate way to do it. And it's not easy if I'm being honest. I mean, I think that brings up a really good question. One, two questions, really. One around how do you define as an artist, like how do you define success? And then two, what is the difference between having fans versus having a following or having numbers? Um, and kind of what's the relationship between those two things? Yeah, I mean, even though I gave a whole spiel about making great songs and making broad appeal, serving your bases, that's your primary thing. Because at the end of the day, like people who, um, you want people who you want you, and then you want to be if you're an independent artist you want to be able to sell hard tickets let's keep it 100 so you want to be able to go and have about at minimum of 300 to 400 people pay 15 to 20 dollars to come see you so that that is that's that's the lifeblood of your business that's the lifeblood of your uh economics uh, sustainability and so from there that's what you should focus on mm -hmm. my challenges for that indie artist is once that is once you're at that place what's the difference between you getting to like your song going from like there to like having like five, 10 million streams. What is it? What ingredients could you put or consider as you're making songs to have that thing? And you know what? Those five, 10 million streams may mean you'll have more followers and less and your fans may not grow as much. However, if the song gains more followers, that's not a bad thing. Take it, that's great. It's more exposure. That's people being introduced to you. And some of them will be friends fans or your point follower, it's fine. As long as you're moving them into the funnel slowly by slow, so like little by little, overall you'll begin to have like more impact and, and, and build real fans that can kind of stay with you through the journey. Can you go more? I, I think this idea of funnel and like multiple entry points for fans is an interesting one. Cause someone might like really be hardcore or someone might hear a song and then they have to kind of go step by step into your, like your ecosystem as an artist. Yeah. Can you, so like how, what might a funnel look like? Um, and how can, for artists who are, who are watching this, like how might they think about setting up a funnel that converts casual listeners or casual followers into more in-depth fans? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, it also depends. In, in, in an ideal world, you'll have you'll have that you know that kind of trajectory of core fans, engage, build, grow, 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 make a big song here, boom, funnel goes more in a perfect world. The caveat I would say is, if you are just a super niche artist that makes music that doesn't have as much propensity to kind of scale, then that funnel process is not as possible because like, it, it, like, you know, if you're making like a certain type of music, um, it's just less likely to like scale at, at, the, at, the, at the rate that I'm talking about. That's the, so, it, so it, for example, let's just be honest. In hip hop right now, melody is a given driven thing in hip hop. We know that. They even made a melodic rap category in the Grammys of hip hop. If you are a rapper that doesn't incorporate melody, I'm not saying you can't scale. I'm not saying you won't. I'm saying, when I'm zooming out, if that is your niche thing, your funnel may just look a lot different than someone who raps and incorporates a little bit of melody because that melody side is just a bigger, more broader um, expression of hip hop. You know what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. if you don't have some of that, it's likely that your funnel is going to be a little bit smaller. And that's okay if that's what's true to you. Make the best non-melodic rap that you can to have the most impact. That's what I'm saying. Um, but if you do want to scale and that funnel can kind of like grow, 
there are certain ingredients and certain things that 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 happens for indie artists that makes the difference. Amina, Amina is a good example. Like there's certain things where it's like, oh, he made this one song that is by in some reasons playing Atlanta strip club. And he's not necessarily a strip club artist, but he's like he raps and he has he had a one song that was like broad enough for a bigger audience. And that song it like catapulted his career, but he still kept his his core like rap fans, you know. So I know that's a lot, but no, I mean, I think what it is, is, is thinking about, do you want quantity or do you want quality? And then being, and making that as a decision, right? Like thinking about your, you know, if music is a business, ideally you have like a business plan. And so thinking about, is your strategy going to be to amass many fans or is your strategy going to be to amass maybe smaller fans, but fans who are willing to pay a higher price or willing to engage? And I think the key point of that is being strategic about it rather than, you know, doing everything you can and like right. seeing what hits or what happens. I um, think Griselda, Griselda's a good example. Griselda mm -hmm. and Vinny the Butcher and all of them, like they, their streams are not huge at all, but they can sell out shows. They do it at art exhibits. So they're making the best version of what they do. And like you said, they thought about it strategically. Maybe non-melodic hardcore rap music is not a streaming win, but you can scale it in other ways if you if it's curated possibly possible curated the right way. So yeah. Well, and, and I think they're also a good example of maybe a larger trend that we're seeing in the industry where artists are moving away from reliance on streams and finding other ways to make income, right? And especially for I mean, like the return on streams, even with like some of the movement to get more money is like one cent, 0.1 cent. It's like, trash. it's trash, it's nothing. And so most artists, right? When, when we look at like Spotify or Billboard, you're looking at like the 1% of artists with like the millions of dollars of label money that goes into getting them there. So most artists aren't gonna be able to get those kinds of numbers. And so that's when we start looking at selling like bundles or special events or, and I'm curious Ace, how you see this trend and the impact that it'll have on the industry as folks move, start to shift away from like, maybe there's other options beyond streaming. Um, it's interesting. I feel like for the, it definitely empowers the independent artists where like um, the independent artists can now, you know, they can, the scale may not be as big. So I think the streaming era means we may not have juggernaut artists the way we used to, you know, I don't know if maybe they can, but I, I don't, I don't see it because, because it's more saturated now. Not everybody mm -hmm. can, it's like, I think it's like, I think it's a stat that said it's like 40,000 songs uploaded to DSPs every Friday, 40,000 songs. So there's just an immense amount of music out there. All that sea of music, my song, could be a and R to tip top shape. Your song could be a and R and created from tip top shape, have all the features and everything, but it may not be able to have mass appeal. So the independent artist that wins and thinks strategically is either A, they figured out how to do the viral impact thing, which I, I, I there's not like a magic formula. There are some metrics you can you can do. I mean, TikTok, it, there, obviously somebody is winning off of it, but it's just hard to bet your whole artist career and budget on that because mm -hmm. what it goes viral we don't know right and then the other side of it is like the artist like but maybe a gazelle that says you know what i'm not gonna play the streaming game i'm gonna play the i'm gonna play the quality game i'm gonna play the niche game and i'm gonna have like the best version of what i do and and, and offer it in a way that you can't so i'm gonna you know and, and and that has been winning for them you know what i'm saying so it just allowed there's multiple ways to win winning does not have to look like the same thing for Griselda as it does for this artist. I think because of that, the artists are more empowered. And by the same token, it's more competitive too. Mm -hmm. So like we could sit up on these panels and give all these like how-tos and blueprints. At the end of the day, we're scratching our heads the same way these marketing execs at labels and to be frankly, our label, people are nobody has a magic formula anymore. There is no magic formula. <laughs> it just doesn't exist. Well, and I think this is the part that we don't talk. I mean, talent is important, strategy is important, but a lot of like chance and luck 
are also a part of it. And I think we don't acknowledge that as often as, as it's real in the industry. Um, I wanna switch gears a little bit because you mentioned the Grammys and you won a Grammy last year with coffee. You're nominated against this year. And I'm curious, I mean, obviously like a Grammy is a huge win, but how do you define success for yourself? Um, I, I would say success for me is like continuing to grow, you know, more so than like, success is a journey more than like a destination. So like growing in what I feel like God has given me every day is like success. So if I'm sharper, wiser um, this year versus last year, in a way that benefits more than just myself, then I think that that's success. If all the, if everything about my growth is self, you know, self-reflecting, then I'm like, uh, I don't know how, I feel like success should be a multiplier. So this should be some kind of residual multiplying impact of whatever you're growing in, you know what I'm saying? So if it's not resonating in that context, for me, I don't really call it successful. So I, I, I can stand here and say like, hey, yes, I helped sign an artist at Reach Records, first female artist, African descent, one day. And two years in, her song is on Michelle Obama's Spotify playlist. I would say, yes, I co-produced that song and helped bring it to fruition. So that's a successful thing, but it's successful because it, I used my gifts to help be a light post for someone else. And then it, now that is like a signpost for her career. And now she's waving that banner. So now more women are being introduced to like positive hip hop and then her platform is growing. So I'm like, that's like a clear cut example of like a, a metric of success for me. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I mean, I what I hear is the ability then to like pay it forward, right? And the idea yeah. that it's not about you as an individual, but how can you support others? And I think that's, I mean, definitely for sure, that's like what Den Music Fest is about. I know a lot of folks who I'm seeing in this room, that's this idea of collaboration. But I, I think a lot of artists are scared to do that, right? We come from this scarcity mentality of, if I support you, then that takes away from my shine. Or if I help you, then that's less followers for me or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. And I think it's false, right? Because the more we work together, the more we amplify. But I'm, I'm curious, Ace, how you've seen that. Maybe if you can share an example or, yeah. or a story about how like collaboration actually does help take a career further. I mean, it's, yeah, it, it's, look, we all, myself included, there's nothing wrong with being ambitious and building what you do. I mean, if I'd be lying if I said I'm not an ambitious person that wants to like, you know, scale what I'm doing. What I am saying is, technically speaking, I won my Grammy last year, it was great, I'm so thankful. And I'll be honest, I had more satisfaction seeing Wande get the nomination for Michelle Obama's playlist. Why? I don't know. It just gave me more, it was like, wow, this, this, this thing, it seemed like more of a team win. You know what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. collaboration is important because great things come in community. Some of the greatest products, some of the greatest artists, some of the greatest pieces of design happen within collaboration and community. I'm a big believer in that, especially on the A&R front. So like a lot of my tracks that I created, produced, I'm generally co-producing with other people putting people in rooms that they wouldn't have expected to work with, with other people. So um, obviously you have to guard the right kind of people to work with, but it's just a, it's just a common old, it's an age old truth. Like a, a team wins because it has the best components and best players in the room. So um, it's a reason, there's a reason why James Harden doesn't have a championship ring. There's a reason why, like it's the reason why Russell Westwood doesn't have a championship ring. There's certain ingredients to like being, being dope like a, like a Steph Curry, who's a, he's ambitious. He's about bettering himself. He's about, you know, make sure his skills are the best, but he's also about aligning with other people who can complement his gifts. And that's where I see like the difference between like good and great, who have mastered the art of like, yo, let me collaborate. So I see that in a lot of the, even Drake, some of the best artists have colla the collaborative, like Beyonce. Um, the list goes on and on and on. 
And so mm -hmm. I think it's just like a, that's just like a, a proven formula to work with people that are dope that can complement your dopeness to make the best final product for everybody. I want to I want to open it up for questions. Um, and so if you do have questions, please definitely drop those in the chat, and we'll um, we'll ask Ace. Graham Wu says, I've never understood why people get intimidated by letting someone else shine. It doesn't dim down your light if you play your role. Um, and I think that's exactly what Ace is talking about, that you can all shine brighter yeah. when you're supporting one another. Um, how, so I wanna ask two questions. One is um, how for people who feel like maybe they don't have a great body of work or they don't have credentials, but they do want to collaborate. How might they go about identifying potential collaborators and like reaching out to collaborators to start to build those relationships beyond like sliding in someone's DMs and being like, let's link, um, which yeah. is not the way to do it. Please don't do that. Um, right. What are more effective ways for folks to, to find and connect with people that they could be working with? Yeah, I mean, um, it's, it's definitely uh, a strategy to it. I mean, people that I've dealt with at like sometimes music industry panels at conferences, they probably hate hearing this, but I, it, it, it's something I did, which was network laterally. Um, it, just, it just makes sense, right? When I was coming up, me and my production partners, Motown, we would basically go out within and work with people who were not, we, we weren't shooting our shots up here. Mm -hmm. We were shooting pretty like here. And we saturated ourselves with the best of the best laterally who we thought were dope. So like we were sending beats to B.O.B. before it was B.O.B. We were sending beats to Rock City before they were Rock City. And just kind of working with the people who we thought were gonna be somewhere. And honestly, 10, 15 years later, most of my peers that were, I was networking with laterally are like um, platinum artists, Grammy nominated songwriters, music execs, label execs, a and R's, man, you name it. So of course, I mean, we did it. You always shot a few shots up top. And this is kind of like, I mean, I, I, de I, de I definitely slid in um, Carrie Hilson's DMs on MySpace like seven years ago or eight years ago, a long time ago. When I was, eh, probably longer than that. When I, when I was coming up and she replied back and I sent her some beats, never heard from her. Maybe she thought it was wet. I definitely sent us as manager of beat tape. And I remember Keith, who's he's, he was his a and to this day. Years later, he saw me, once he started to come around and we kind of had like elevated, he was like, yo man, I remember you. And those beats you sent me were trash, bro. <laughs> so like, I think it's okay. But if you exhaust all your attention with like, I don't hear back from Ace or this a and or this artist manager that, oh man, this is not gonna work for me. It's like the next me, or, or even scratch that, the next like, um, you know, the next like uh, future music exec, it's probably a peer that's got an artist right now that is like grinding. That could be the next person you need to connect to. So don't put all the energy and emphasis on people like me because I'm actually looking for some of that young talent anyway. So just be mindful of like your network across, you know what I mean? Yeah, no, I know. I think that's so important. And I think part of that is thinking about building long-term relationships rather than mm -hmm. transactional, here's my beat, here's an exchange, let's go back and forth and then we're done. But really looking at how artists, how you can support one another and grow together over the course of time. Um, and, yep. I, and I've seen, you know, that could mean like get four of your friends and do a virtual show together or yeah, find a friend and exactly, like cross pollinate exactly. on some, yeah. hey, I'll push your track, you push my track or you know, mention me in your newsletter, I'll mention you in mine. Like collaboration can look, it can show up in so many different ways. Um, I mean, I can offer Den Music Fest as an, ex as an example where, right. you know, Culture Fix and Den Music Fest are coming together to share platforms and um, networks and introduce one another to each other's networks and both grow that way. And so I think it's partly thinking about the long term, but also getting really creative about the kinds of asks that you want to make from people beyond just like, hey, place my song in your next project. Hey, right. you know, I rap, yeah. um, but really thinking about what else you might have to offer. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Well said. Well, I mean, yeah, you, you hit it right on the head. I love that.
Um, Y'all, as I said, if you have any questions for ACE, please drop those in the chat. We'll open them up um, in just a minute, but definitely please send in your questions. Um, ACE is, you know, we want this to be as beneficial to you as possible. Um, you mentioned ACE working for a faith-based label. And now, especially we're seeing more and more artists start to speak up, whether it's about faith or social justice issues. Do you feel like that holds artists back or is it something, or do you feel like it's ever held you back or is there more of a space for those kinds of things now than we've ever seen before? Um, good question. I feel like um, it's definitely, people are more open to it. It's cool because when you have like artists with huge platforms from Justin Bieber, Chance the Rapper, Kanye West being like very explicit about their faith, it makes it, it kind of normalizes it where it's not as taboo anymore, which I think is overall good because at the end of the day, hip hop is just it's supposed to be rooted in authenticity. So when I'm jamming the 21 Savage, who I actually like this project with Metro, I'm not jamming to it because I can relate to what he's saying, but it more so that I believe in what he's saying and, and that it's authentic to where he's coming from. So when I'm driving down Glenwood Avenue, where he's from, I'm like, it makes sense to me why he's saying the things he's saying, because this is the culture that he's cut from. I may not endorse everything he's putting out there, but it's authenticity. Same thing when you, I think you hear like a Lecrae or when you hear like a, um, or Andy Minio, like they're, they're coming from, they're speaking authentic to their life experience and their worldview. So I think hip hop is the, the space where authentic communication thrives the best amongst any genre. You know what I'm saying? Um, so I, yeah, I think it's good. And um, has it ever held me back? Um, probably less now. Earlier on, there were rumblings of some of that when I was coming up in the music business. And there were certain decisions I had to make where I felt like my faith in God or my faith in Jesus was made me an anomaly. So a less likely candidate for certain opportunities. But I just kind of trusted my instinct and kind of being authentic to myself. And, in the long haul, that authentic perspective was more of a distinction for me that, you know, may have seemingly held me back in moments, but overall, I think it was actually a win, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, well, and, and it goes back to, I think, what you were talking about earlier, that the more you understand your niche and your core audience, and you give them something that they want, the more that's going to help you as an artist make that connection. And so if there's an audience that wants faith-based stuff, or if they want you know, politically conscious messaging, or they want atheist stuff, like on the other side of it, if that's your thing, yeah. then it, it's part of building that bridge to an audience that maybe isn't being spoken to in the industry. Um, Absolutely. What would you say is, is one of the bigger mistakes that you see artists making these days? That's a great question. Um... I mean, this is more of a financial thing. So I'm speaking more so for the, from a label standpoint and even from a major label standpoint with some of my friends who have signed artists to major labels. Uh, I think artists have made some of the most irresponsible financial decisions with their business models. So uh, the idea of portraying instead of having um, mm. and the misuse of money and, and, and the misuse of platforms like sometimes there, there's cases where a label would give an artist a deal in advance and sometimes the lawyer may negotiate it for the artist and their manager to have authority over that advance let's say they have authority over the marketing budget and so i've seen people you know blow the marketing budget for clout and miss out on opportunities to help either a further their career or set up investments for them to thrive if their career doesn't thrive. So like, that's probably a pain point I see, which is like, ah. So even at like the label I'm at now, um, Lecrae, who was an artist, obviously and the artists are there. He's set up like financial workshops. But the artists that he signed to just help them understand how to manage money, taxes. When you do a show in Canada, you gotta pay taxes. Little things about mm -hmm. money management artistry that I think a lot of artists are just, for whatever reason, just not educated about. And it ends up, and, and especially when they're under 25 and younger, and you're like, you have this like utopian idea of being 
in Jamaica in the next few years, and then it doesn't happen, and you have not a footing to stand on financially. So um, that's something I think is a thing for me. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think especially, you know, we sometimes think of extremes, right? Either you're like Drake level superstar, or you're like struggling, but more and more we're seeing people who are able to carve a place for themselves as working artists. And right. so I think that further emphasizes how important it is to have that money management financial strategy, but to really like treat it like a business. Yes, absolutely. I, I like uh, that term, working artist. That's still not starving, but working artists. Yeah. So right. And 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 I will say, because I know a lot of people who are part of our den community are artists and they're making music and they're earning money, but they're also working jobs and doing other things. And I just want to say that it doesn't make you any less of an artist. Mm -hmm. um, and if you play the money part strategically, you can start to transition over time, um, which does, yeah, which doesn't make you any less of an artist. Uh, um, absolutely. Y'all, we're here with Ace Harris um, at Den Music Fest 2020. I want to open it up to the audience and see if anyone has um, questions or things they want Ace to kind of go into any further. Um, so I really, I invite you to turn on your cameras if you feel comfortable, um, but at the very least unmute yourselves or drop a question in the chat box. Well, um... I guess I'll go first. Uh, so Ace, I wanted to know more specifically with you in, in your field, I, I noticed that from time to time you may drop something and say like, hey, I'm looking for production um, at, at this moment in time. What, when, you, when you put a message out there like that, what are you expecting um, to get back? Like as far as, or well, better question, what, puts your attention to the person that sent that email versus um, just looking at it like any other email coming through your inbox? Um, well, I, I mean, I think brevity, like being short and to the point uh, is definitely helpful. And, and so that's number one, but we, we do try to go through every submission, especially when it comes to producers, which is the nature of when I send stuff out. So, um, but I mean, if, if you got like 20 beats in a folder and the first three are pretty like just terrible, I'm probably not gonna get through the rest of the 17. But, you know, just just like etiquette, right? It's just like, you know, uh, maybe, maybe attachment of three is better than like five emails of 10 beats attached. You know what I'm saying? It's just like concise communication. I think if, any, if, if imagine yourself kind of going through that clutter and what would, be appealing to someone else because what's funny is you, it's funny you ask that as someone who takes submissions i also manage two producers and an artist and i'm pitching stuff to other a and r's and other artist managers and i've learned how to be more like uh tactful in how i communicate so there's, there's a couple a and r's that i'm pitching beats to and ironically i'm an a and r and i'm and i send in beats to other a and r's for, for producers that i man that i manage and i realized Okay, this AR, he's on the West Coast. In my opinion, I'm an AR. People check beats either in the morning or late at night. So I would sometimes schedule my emails of attachments to like, like, yo, this is gonna go out at 10 Western time. And it's gonna be three tracks, and that's it. And I do stuff like that. And I, I even with artists I was pitching beats for, I would like have an artist that was in the UK, it's Afrobeat artist. And I would like just kind of watching his gram and kind of seeing the time he's active, and I'm like, there's a time I think that would be best. He seems like he'll be up late. And so if I send a beat at like five in the morning, his time, he may check it. And he, it worked. He got back to me instantly. So like, it's just being tactful and strategic about who you're sending and what the person receiving may be best prone to like actually read the email, so. Thank you. I think that's good advice too for people if you're pitching to like blogs or publications and Justin actually maybe you can speak on this but when you are anything that you're pitching you want to make sure that it's tailored to the person that you're pitching to so if ace is asking for afro beats or justin is writing about hip-hop and you send like a country song 
that's not a good fit. And so really make sure that you're tailoring instead of cookie cutter responses, really tailoring to the people that you're sending to. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. No, I agree with that. Just um, running a website, uh, we take submissions Monday through Friday, right? And within that, we have these guidelines and it, it got to a point to where emails were overwhelming. So I started using a service and through that service, I still set parameters and you'll be amazed at how many people don't read those parameters. And so, like you said, we are a hip hop website and we do post R and B, but sending in a country song or um, sending in a pop record, while that pop record may be great, it's not what we're looking for. And so your submission will get denied because you really didn't do your research. So I think that's super important as well. And then to make sure that your links work, we take submissions at Den Music Fest and people send us links and the link doesn't work. And so that's a terrible reason to not get considered for something because you didn't double check. Um, so just that attention to detail. Um, and Google Drive, Google Drive is the worst, I'm sorry. Google Drive, <laughs> please no Google Drives. Um, anyone else can have a you, question? I'm, I'm sorry, Nora, no, can no, I ask ahead. Ace, what, what's your reasoning for not liking Google Drive for people that didn't know that that, okay. that can be an issue? It's not that it's not, it can work. But I think from what I, from my understanding, Google Drive requires the sender to set a setting so that it can be, whatever link is being sent can be shared with all parties received. So it's like an extra step. You have to like make sure it's going out. So most people give, the, they, they send it and then I click on it and it's like, um, I can't access this. And it's like, yo, my man, why are you sending me something I can't access? And then it's not really mobile friendly, I would say either. It's gotcha. just not like, a Dropbox, a box link is just a little bit better to go through if I'm on the phone or on the go. Whereas a Google link, I feel like I, I feel more comfortable on the computer or desktop. Gotcha. Any other questions for Ace? I know if this was Clubhouse, everybody would have something to say. <laughs> right, right. Um, well, I want to thank Ace for spending his Monday afternoon with us. Um, thank you for the information and all the time. Um, Ace, where can people connect with you and learn more about your music and your artists? Hey, um, you can just follow me at Ace Harris Music on Instagram or Twitter. Um, also on Facebook. If, I, I generally post updates there. Um, be on the lookout for um, an artist named Toye, Afrobeat artist, super dope. He's just... Um, recently wrote a song on the Beatles album and uh, we have some new drop with him next top of next year. So stay tuned and uh, really appreciate you, Nora and, and, and Jay Good for what y'all do for the artist community. And uh, yeah, it was great. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, so at Ace Harris Music across all social media platforms, if you missed day one of Den Music Fest, um, Grand Wu is asking any financial literacy tips and or books? Um. I would say rich dad, poor dad for one. Um, but um, yeah, I'll, I'll probably tell him to uh, DM me and I can, and I, can uh, I can also um, send him send him some stuff. But uh, my, I mean, honestly, the financial stuff for artists is really just about money management in general. So, I mean, it's not necessarily an artist specific book I would, I would share, but just in general, managing your money well, so. Yeah, thank you, Ace. Um, Natalie's dropping all of Ace's links in the chat along with um, Toye's music. Um, if you missed day one of Den Music Fest, the whole festival is up on YouTube. Um, and I know Natalie's going to drop that link in the chat in just a second as well. Um, thank you all for hanging out with us. Thank you for all your questions. Please go out and make good music. We've got two more artist workshop, artist development workshops today. So come back in a couple hours. Um, thank you, everyone, and keep taking care of yourselves and each other. Appreciate y'all.